330 of you, 330 that have joined this webinar, which is a real record for all to see. So thank you for being with us. Again, my name is Val Zavala. I'm a retired television journalist here in Los Angeles. I'm speaking to you now from Altadena, which is right near Pasadena. And we have an amazing program for all of you who have joined us today. Um, but before I get to telling you about these incredible women, I do want to mention that all to see is, in case you haven't heard about this, is a, it's a nonprofit um, company, it's like an incubator that's based physically at the port of LA. And it is designed to bring together both profit and nonprofit uh, ocean based or marine based um, companies so that they can learn from each other and grow together. So it's kind of like an incubator for the blue economy and Altasi has done a series of these webinars and I'm very happy to have you join us for this one. All right, so we are going to look at women explorers in terms of the ocean, women who have whose science background and their ability to communicate and their desire for exploration has, has uh, really given them some pretty exciting adventures that they're going to share. And we, of course, will also want to get to your questions. I do want to, however, just also mention one little bit of housekeeping that all to see this Saturday is putting on an amazing event in this era of COVID. Everybody's had to get really creative. So they have this launched a fundraiser and it's, um, it's happening at, at San Pedro where the USS Iowa is and you drive in, it's going to be like a drive in event and they project on the US Iowa all sorts of amazing things <laughs> that have been commissioned. Um, let's see, it's a drive-in experience that will honor those who have paved the way for all to see and who will continue to forge new paths. Highlights include new footage of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, an appearance by Dr. Bob Ballard, who discovered the Titanic wreckage and is one of all to see's strongest partners, a one-night only commissioned art installation projected on the USS Iowa, and much more. So the drive-in is also brought to us by Energy Independence Now, and it will be powered by Toyota's cutting edge hydrogen fuel technology. And also Academy Award winner, Dame Helen Mirren has recorded a special message. So if you'd like to join them tomorrow night at the Port of LA in your car, you can get tickets. It's really gonna be an amazing event and you can get tickets and learn more about it at altasee-project-blue.org or just go to altasee.org. I think you'll be able to see the, um, the blue hour event it's called okay let me now introduce um, some amazing women with us is among the three dr dawn wright she joins us by the way from redland southern california uh dr wright she says just call her dawn dawn is the chief scientist of the environmental systems research institute or called isri i how do you pronounce it dawn you can say uh esri or esri uh -huh. esri Early in her career, she became the first African women, African American female to dive to the ocean floor. She has never stopped breaking through barriers. She currently plays a critical role at Esri by strengthening the scientific foundation for their software and services. Esri is a world leader in geographic information system software. In other words, the software that figures out what's kind of shape and what's going on in the oceans research and development as well. And Dawn represents the company to the international scientific community. Dawn is also an active board member with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and other conservation agencies. She's also a courtesy professor, does that mean you used to teach there? At the Geography, uh, geography and Oceanography at, in the College of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Scientists, basically at the Oregon State University. You used to teach at Oregon State University, right? Right, go beeves. <laughs> That's what all that means. <laughs> and she was honored as the Oregon Professor of the Year in 2007. Her mission, I think part of the mission of, of many of you is to get this, and we'll talk more about it, this huge project to get the entire ocean floor mapped by 2030. I think all of you are involved in that in some way, shape, or form. So welcome, Dawn. Also with us is Dr. Carly Weiner. Carly is Director of Communications and Engagement Strategy at the Schmidt Ocean Institute. They're based in Palo Alto. That's a philanthropic, international, seagoing facility dedicated to open ocean research. She has over 13 years of experience in marine science communications. Carly has taught several courses throughout her career, specializing in communicating oceanography and marine science to the public, really important. 
She has over 12 publications printed in top scientific research journals. Carly previously held the position of communications manager for Centers for Ocean Science Education. I'm sorry, not finished. Center for Ocean Science Education Excellence, Island Earth. See, everyone loves long titles. And prior to that, she worked as the research and out, outreach specialist for Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii. For six years, she has hosted the monthly, for six years she hosted, oh yeah, she had a science radio show that she hosted for a while. It was called All Things Marine. Carly has also developed and implemented several outreach programs and curriculum, including the Changing Tides and Take a Bite Out of Fish Feeding Campaigns. We'll hear a little bit more about that. Not always good for people to feed fish. And Carly has over 12 publications in major scientific journals and has co-written The Ocean Fest, which is Families Exploring Science Together. Welcome so much, Carly. And also with us is Allison Fundus. She joined us from the Bay Area, Vallejo, if you know what that is. Allison is Chief Operating Officer of the Ocean Exploration Trust, which is, the, the trust is based in Silver Spring, I believe, but you're in, in uh, you join us from Bay Area. Carly, I'm sorry, Allison has spent much of the last 15 years exploring the deep sea, investigating submarine volcanoes and other unique ecosystems, including shipwrecks. She even helped search for Amelia Earhart's airplane. For those of you who are too young, Amelia Earhart was a few first female aviator. Her plane went down in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in 1937, and it's been a mystery ever since as to what happened to her. She disappeared. And Allison's work has taken her to remote stretches of the world where she has led, where she has led or participated in more than 50 expeditions at sea. As COO for Ocean Exploration Trust, Allison leads a team of talented scientists, engineers, and educators to conduct annual missions aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. She is passionate about making authentic opportunities in STEM available to students, educators, and the public through her work. And she also serves as the If Then Ambassador for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Welcome, all of you. That's the most talking I'm going to do from now on because the rest is going to be you and our participants. I want to also remind people so you can start sending your questions via chat, and I'll be getting them and we'll be um, hopefully answering as many of your questions as possible. But let's start uh, with Allison. Allison, you have participated in over 50 expeditions around the world. Um, regardless of gender, your experience puts you in pretty elite company. What kinds of things did you do among those 50 expeditions? And what, what, what would give us an example of maybe one of the more exciting ones? Oh, sure. Uh, so yeah, I've been very fortunate as part of what really got me interested in this career to begin with is like all of the places that a uh, career in marine science can really take you. Um, so I really, I started kind of uh, with the grunt work on, on a ship. So I started uh, more as a marine technician uh, and just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, and that was kind of the inspiration for me to go back to school and go to graduate school for an additional degree in geology. Um, and so that's really kind of what set the hook in, in me when I, when I first started going to sea. Um, and from there, I just kind of kept building my skill sets and playing different roles and putting different hats on, as I'm sure everybody that's ever been on a research expedition is well used to. Um, and, and so now I, I, I'm one of the expedition leads for, for Ocean Exploration Trust. And so kind of take over the role of, of organizing and orchestrating the, the entire expedition. So it's been a great career. And we're going to learn about that. We're going to learn a little bit of what it, what it really is like to be on one of those boats. I think all of you have spent a long time sometimes on boats. So we're going to learn more about what it's actually like to be there. Dawn, you have an amazing career as well. And tell us a little bit about your company and uh, what geo mapping of the ocean is. So I, I am so excited to be here with these uh, lovely ladies and uh, my experience in mapping uh, started off uh, very similar to Allison's uh, in terms of being a marine technician and being on uh, various mapping cruises or expeditions where we used uh, sound in the ocean to discern what the ocean bottom is like. And so after uh, working and teaching about that at Oregon State, uh, I was hired on to this company Esri, which actually makes the software that takes the data that comes from these uh, research vessels and is able to translate that data uh, into 
maps. We call them treasure maps uh, of the ocean so that you can discern uh, scientific insights uh, so that you can explore. And the reason why we do it as a company is because there's so many uh, amazing uses for, for mapping the ocean, mapping the ocean floor, but also mapping the water above and all the way up to the sea surface. Uh, emergency uh, response. So for instance, we're hearing about a hurricane now that's barreling down uh, again on Louisiana, Hurricane Delta, and we uh, can use our software to map the temperature uh, of the ocean, which is the sort of the engine for that hurricane, which is making it, f the, the warm water makes it a, a fiercer and a longer, uh, a slower moving uh, event. We, we use uh, mapping for uh, port. So with, especially with Alta Sea being a port, the, uh, we make traffic maps of, of the ships going in and out of the port. Uh, we also uh, make maps that uh, commercial fishermen use. Uh, especially if they are trying to get to the best places uh, to fish. And the flip side of that is that we also uh, help to make maps that show where uh, coral reefs and other fisheries habitats need to be left alone and preserved. So a lot of what we, uh, our software is used in the design of marine protected areas or offshore parks. Uh, we make all kinds of maps that uh, help us in terms of understanding what's going to happen if storm, storm surges or tsunamis uh, feel the bottom once they get to shore and what those waves are going to do once they splash onto the shore and run on land. So that's a, it's a, those maps are safety maps that are used to help people evacuate. Uh, there, there's so many other uh, maps uh, that can be made with, with our software and with other uh, groups that uh, create this type of software, but those are those are some of the big big uses and why it's so important to to have the ocean mapped. Yeah, like of course we know how important it is to have terrestrial terrain based maps. It's absolutely even more important when we can't see where we're going if you're in yeah. the ocean. So maps of all kinds are important. Um, Carly, tell us a little bit about why you went into sort of the communications of uh, science to the public. I always loved the ocean and I actually grew up in Canada um, in Toronto where there wasn't any ocean and so I thought it was really really important to be able to make those links to those who are landlocked uh, to the ocean and always had a passion for being able to talk to audiences and really trying to make people understand that um, you know our influence on the ocean, the ocean's influence on you no matter where you are in the world. And so that's been sort of a lifelong passion and I've been really fortunate to have a lot of unique opportunities to both put one foot in the science and one foot in the communications and interchange those um, continuously. So that's been a, a really amazing experience for me. And I want to ask all of you, can you think of uh, a turning point or just that and it could be a conversation, it could be something you read, it could be an experience you had that just tipped the scales and led you into this whole realm of some form of oceanography. Um, because, I mean, it's one thing to be brought up in, in a family of doing of this or that. It makes sense that children go in the same direction. But I'm not sure if that's true of, of you. Do you. Did you have parents or families that were at all oriented toward the ocean? We'll start with Dawn. No, my, my parents were not oriented to the, uh, the ocean at all, although my father uh, was from South Carolina, from Charleston, and I think that's where I got my fetish for pirates. <laughs> my mother is also from a port city. She was born in Baltimore, uh, but neither of them, my father was a basketball coach and my mother was uh, an instructor of uh, speech communication. But what happened to us is that our family moved to Hawaii, where Carly is. And I was raised in Hawaii. I was raised on the island of Maui. So that was definitely a turning point for me because that com combined with watching Jacques Cousteau, uh, I'm, I'm older, so I grew up in the 60s and Jacques <laughs> Cousteau was huge back then. So that's what uh, captivated so many of us to become uh, oceanographers. And then uh, seeing uh, people like uh, Sylvia Earle and her uh, early expeditions, uh, Bob Ballard and, and his uh, expeditions, uh, uh, all of that uh, 
played played a role for me. And then similarly to what Allison shared, when I uh, was able to finally go to college and graduate school, and I became a marine tech and was uh, at sea for about six months, you know, off and on six months out of the year, that really solidified it for me. Oh, and I'm sorry, Alice, who, who did we miss? Allison, was there a moment that, or an event or some kind of experience that just really established your trajectory? I think I think for me it was probably a collection of, of little moments. Um, you know, like like Carly, I, I also grew up in a landlocked area. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. We did not, you know, we had lakes, but we didn't have the ocean nearby. Uh, my grandparents lived in Florida, like a lot of grandparents do. Um, so I'd go and visit them, and sometimes go fishing with my grandfather. Uh, and I just always loved being around boats and loved being on the water. Um, so that was definitely one of the, the early memories. Um, and as soon as I could, you know, I was always begging my parents to, uh, to get certified in scuba diving. Um, so, so I did that uh, at, you know, at the age of 14, when the, the youngest age that you can do that. Um, so they let me, or they drove me down to the Gulf Coast and, and let me get certified by a pretty brave uh, uh, individual who was a former Navy SEAL. Uh, my first experience was diving right after a big storm had gone through the Gulf of Mexico and you just look at the surface and it was full of jellyfish. And he said, we're going in anyway. So, <laughs> you know, it was kind of that, you know, kind of just jump in and then go for it attitude. And I feel like, you know, I, I loved it once we got in getting stung by jellyfish, uh, you know, but it's kind of a metaphor for just kind of keep on pushing through it all, you know, and, and you'll, you'll see some amazing things down there. So. I'm sorry, did you say you did get stung by jellyfish? Even in the mouth, yeah. One of, one of the early things that you have to do when you're getting trained uh, for scuba diving is to take your regulator out and retrieve it to show that you can do that in an emergency situation. And we did that and little tentacles got wrapped up in, in the regulator and put it back in your mouth. So. What does it feel like <laughs> for those of us who will never, ever, ever Friends, but, be stung know, by a jellyfish? You get over it. So, <laughs> you know, it's, oh, it's I, like I really that certification, so, so <laughs> come through it. <laughs> oh, geez, Don, tell us about an experience that you remember that uh, that can only be had in the ocean. <laughs> I'm sorry, Val. Which who? who oh, either one. We'll start with Don and then go to Carly. Uh, an experience that is only uh, ocean-based, ocean-based ocean -based. experience that you especially remember. Okay, so for me. Uh, my uh, career going to sea started as a marine technician aboard a scientific drill vessel that's still out on the ocean now. It's the Joides uh, Resolution. And because it's a scientific drilling vessel, they are uh, on station uh, for, for long periods of time. And basically, they're usually out at sea for two months at a time. So uh, the expeditions that I was on started off in Antarctica, and then from there we went into the Indian Ocean. And on our transects, we cross the equator uh, quite a bit. And there has been a tradition at sea, uh, and Carly and Allison, I hope you guys are both shellbacks as well, <laughs> having crossed the equator. Uh, there's a tradition at sea that is borrowed from the US Navy on US, US research vessels where you go through a mild form of hazing. Uh, if you have not crossed the equator before, you're called a polywog and you have to go through a series of difficult experiences, I'll put them that way, in order to enter the realm of shellbacks. And uh, because I was on a drilling vessel, uh, one of the uh, rigors that we had to do was to be uh, dipped into a, a vat of drilling mud, which was uh, is not nearly as bad as getting stung by a jellyfish, but it was pretty gross. And then we also had to kiss the baby, which in, the parlance of this, our fellow uh, seagoing uh, folk is they, they get the biggest guy on the ship and they get something gross from the galley, spread it on his tummy and you have to go face first and kiss the baby, kiss the belly. <laughs> and then having gotten through that, <laughs> you are then uh, uh, welcomed into the realm of shellbacks. You uh, no longer have to go through that. In fact, you get the honor of doing, uh, of uh, overseeing uh, such rigors the next time you go to sea and cross the equator, except this time you get to mete out the punishment. And so 
for, for me, uh, the next time I had to do that, uh, I was uh, asked to be uh, in King Neptune's court uh, it, to oversee these polywogs, and I was given the role of Davy Jones, who was the scurvy pirate uh, to read the charges against the polywogs. Like, you <laughs> took the last dish of ice cream in the galley, you're going to get, you're going to get it. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, I think I've crossed the equator uh, four times, and so each each one of those experiences was was amazing, <laughs> and no one got hurt. <laughs> see, science isn't always so serious, right? That's right. You can't that see behind that. my screen now, but I what have my Cell back certificate hanging on my wall. <laughs> you see, we and we many of us never go anywhere without our certificates, just in case. Well done, Carly. <laughs> Carly, what's an especially memorable at sea? Now, I know that you, most of your work is communications. It might, might be land-based, but, but you've had some at sea events. Yeah, sure. I've been really fortunate to have um, quite a few at sea experiences, and all have been memorable for different reasons. But um, I think early on in my career, um, I had the pleasure of sailing several times to the Pahana Mukuakea Marine National Monument um, in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And for anyone who's been there, that place is just incredibly special for so many reasons. Um, but there is one particular area, Cure Atoll, that um, I will never forget uh, experience being there. You know, you have a lua or a bluefin trevally as big as you swimming in the water, crystal clear waters. Um, on a particular uh, dive there, there was manta rays that came through. So it's just an incredibly special place and just feel really fortunate to have been able to um, experience that. Falkor is also a really amazing ship. Um, that's what's behind me here. Um, and I've been really lucky to be able to sail on that several times and experience uh, several shellback ceremonies. Got it. That's, uh, it just shows you that there's, it's not all so serious. I'd love for you now to, each of you have kind of a different angle on uh, ocean issues. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about how what you do pertains to an especially uh, difficult ocean problem. Okay, because we all know the oceans are really stressed right now, whether it be, you know, plastic or temperature or coral reefs dying. So can you, can you relate what you're doing to uh, uh, a problem or a challenge that exists in ocean, large or small? And I'll let you would like to start. I can jump in there. Allison, go, oh, Allison, go ahead. Are you sure? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so with uh, Ocean Exploration Trust and uh, Exploration Vessel Nautilus, we, I think we really kind of take the big pic picture approach. Um, so we're really, our mission is to do ocean exploration for the community at large. Um, and so our, in our mission, we really want to prioritize what the community is prioritizing and go where the community really wants to, to look. Um, and so uh, every few years we'll have a workshop and, and put a call out to, to the researchers and the oceanographic community saying, hey, if we're gonna have our ship in this region of the world, what are the priority both areas, but also disciplines that, that we really need to look at to really address some of the most critical problems uh, that, we're, that we're facing. And so a lot of the work that we do is really the baseline research for biological assessments and geological phenomena, uh, chemistry in the water. Uh, and we also do a lot of uh, maritime history um, and cultural uh, sites as well. Um, so, so we really try to take a very interdisciplinary approach to everything uh, while addressing some of those, those key important issues like climate change and um, other, other topics that we're all dealing with. So if I get it right, you are able to offer your services as a seagoing vessel that's able to move around to scientists or, or oceanographers who need a particular uh, piece of information or some kind of work done or data gathered. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And I, I know, you know, similar for, for Carly's organization at Schmidt, um, you know, all, all of our data and everything that we find uh, is open access. And so it is available to the public. Um, all of the samples that we take go into repositories so people can request those samples. Um, they can access our data, our video. And, and one of the, my favorite things that we do uh, is that we stream everything live. 
Um, so we really, uh, you know, and, you know, this year has really highlighted the need for it. But, you know, for, we're, for the past decade, we've been streaming all of our expeditions live to the public and to researchers on shore. So we can really expand the footprint of the expertise that are on the ship to scientists and educators and students that are on shore that can also really benefit from, from where we're exploring. Oh, that's phenomenal. Okay, tell us a little bit more about Don, how what you're doing relates to a particular ocean challenge. So uh, with, our, with our software, our software is used by both uh, organizations, uh, Allison's organization oh. and Carly's organization. In fact, we sent one of our uh, maritime specialists uh, out on the Nautilus to, to work with, with that team on making uh, bathymetric maps uh, with our software. And that's the wonderful thing uh, about uh, being on the software side of things, because we don't have a ship. Uh, many of us who work at this company have had uh, long careers uh, at sea. In fact, we've got a former captain of the Mexican Navy and a former NOAA Corps captain among our maritime team. But uh, our software is used by so many different organizations uh, for, for solving uh, ocean, for, for finding ocean solutions. So in terms of the oceans uh, heating up too much because of, of uh, climate change, uh, our software is used to actually map what that change is like over all of the oceans. We can map from at a global scale how the ocean is, is getting too hot or even at a local scale uh, just within the port of Los Angeles, for instance, or our software is used to uh, also tackle or to understand problems such as ocean acidification uh, with the oceans uh, heating up too much because they're absorbing too much carbon dioxide because we have too much greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, there's also the idea of protecting the ocean before things get, uh, before there's a tipping point and we're, we're we are losing so many species, but the work that, that Allison and Carly uh, do, their organizations do, is very critical to uh, establishing areas that need to be protected, like our national parks. And so our software is used to design those areas. Uh, what should be the wow. boundaries of those areas oh, wow. uh, horizontally on the sea surface, but mm -hmm. uh, a marine protected area is something that extends from the sea surface all the way down to the sea floor. And so what, what should that look like and what kinds of uses should be allowed? Should there be fishing uh, allowed in that mm -hmm. area, even though it's protected? There are all kinds of different um, activities that are, are allowed in marine protected areas. Some of them are completely no take, pristine, stay away. This area needs to recover. And some of them allow different levels of activity. So our, our software is used as a, a planning software, if you will. It's called Coastal and Marine Spatial Planning. Wow, that is basic to almost everything that goes on in terms of ocean research. Um, Carly, what, what kind of, how does your work relate to well, I was going to say, actually, it's all related. Um, both it is all related. Uh, John and Allison's organizations are great uh, collaborators with Schmidt Ocean Institute. And, you know, what's really important is the characterization. And so I think that's what we're all able to do um, with our organizations. Falcor also goes out to sea and offers scientists ship time in exchange for open access data. Um, and it's, it's about mapping, which is what we use ESRI um, software for, but also it's about characterizing what's in the deeper ocean that we don't know a lot about. And a lot of people might not realize that we don't know everything about our ocean. In fact, we know very little about our ocean. And so every opportunity to go out to sea, to um, send an ROV, an underwater robot down, to see what these ecosystems or habitats look like, to understand where those protected area boundary should be and what lives there and how the deeper sea is connected to um, you know shallower ecosystems is really really critical and so being able to find all these amazing things uh, out with the technology is, is so important in fact this year we still made new discoveries we've we've had over 40 new species discovered in australia while we've been doing our um, robotic dive so wow. Really, really important work there um, in order to understand our oceans and, and provide information for managers and policymakers and the communities that we're working into. 
it's phenomenal how we're still discovering new species. You know, it's, <laughs> and as far as mapping goes, I guess it's true that the famous phrase, we know more about the moon or even Mars, we've mapped them better than we have our own oceans. So that's, it's mapping is, is as I said, key to everything. Um, we have a question, so I'm going to do it. Uh, for Donna, for anyone really, while mapping, the, while mapping the ocean floor, have they ever been able to determine, or I guess I mean find a shipwreck? <laughs> yes, uh, especially, oh, for, really? and, and it's not as um, spectacular of a, of a situation as trying to find uh, the wreck of Amelia Earhart's plane, or uh, many of us have been involved in trying to find uh, the wreck of the MH370, uh, that plane that was lost. But uh, for a while, I was doing some uh, coastal mapping in American Samoa. And uh, we did, uh, my colleagues uh, from the University of South Florida, this is when I was at Oregon State, uh, we uh, actually did the first seafloor map of Pongo Pongo Harbor. Where is that? So, uh, so that is on the island of Tutuila, which is part of American Samoa. American Samoa uh -huh. is one of our territories. It's in the, right. the western part of the Pacific, uh, the Southwest Pacific. It's where we get most of the our tuna. Uh, chicken of the sea and um, uh, I forget the other because I don't start starkest starkest thank you <laughs> the, the those are those are two major factories there uh, and distribution points uh, in uh, American Samoa and most of the tuna that the United States gets comes through that that port at any rate that, that port bathymetry had not been mapped before and we did find the wreck of a navy ship uh, in our bathymetry, and it turned out the story behind that wreck was that that ship exploded in uh, during World War II and sank, and it has just been left alone. Wow. The Navy has not had the funds to salvage it. It actually is a source of pollution in the harbor because even after all of these years, it's still uh, leaking uh, uh, fuel and, and, and oil, very small amounts, but it is it is a hazard in the harbor, and now uh, the, the map that we were able to make has been uh, added to the uh, nautical charting uh, for that that region. Wow, interesting. Another question. I know, always exciting to find things you don't expect. Uh, let's see, it's from Linda. As a very senior, senior woman who experienced sex discrimination during my airline career in the 70s and 80s, I would like to know if these very accomplished women have had such experiences. So what kind of uh, challenges or experiences have you had when it comes to being a woman in still, you know, a predominantly male world? Anybody? Oh, and right. how did you? Do, and how did you deal with it? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just say very quickly uh, because I think I'm the oldest of the three here. So uh, my my career uh, started in the in the '80s. And uh, during that time, uh, there was still the idea that women uh, did not belong at sea. Now, if you talk to uh, women who are older than me, the, the stories just, they just get worse and worse. Well, even to the point where there, were, there was no place for a woman to, to use the facilities on, on a ship to go to the bathroom. Uh, but in, in my case, uh, attitudes at sea were, were starting to change and get better, but there were still, there was always someone who believed that you did not belong there that you are not physically strong enough to handle the equipment or the rigors of being at sea. And so uh, the worst that happened to me was that I was dealing with a piece of equipment and a guy just shoved me aside and said, look, let me handle this. You can't handle this. Uh, but but that, that was uh, the worst of it. And uh, the things have gotten progressively better in, in my experience. But that's my colleagues, I'd like to, I'd love to hear from Carly and Allison on, on this one. Yeah, that's actually very encouraging. Seth, Seth was the worst of it. It's, um, it's better than, of course, you know, I think also, isn't it a little bit different in the scientific world, the academic world versus say an oil rig? <laughs> you know, it's going to be a whole different yes. culture. <laughs> I would think it's, uh, it's a much better culture with scientists. Yes. Uh, any other thoughts from Allison or Carly? Yeah, jump in. Um, I, you know, I, I've been very fortunate in my career um, and definitely have a lot of respect for all of the women that kind of went through, uh, you know, kind of the groundbreaking and kind of the efforts of being some of the first females at sea on these research ships. I've, I've had the experience of being the only female on a research ship and I think uh, luckily that is very odd to have happen these days. Um, mm -hmm. I am very 
fortunate and proud to work with an organization that really moves towards equity at sea. Um, and so we've, I mean, we've on our ship uh, with the Ocean Exploration Trust, we've got a pretty fair, fair balance of, of men and women out there. Um, so we're, we're very proud of that. So I've, I've been very fortunate in my career to have very positive experiences at sea. Oh, well, that's great. Good news for young women interested in this. Carly, your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think it, the trend is definitely in a positive direction. Like Allison, um, you know, I have so much respect for those who came before us, and um, we also Schmidt Ocean Institute has um, a fairly equitable uh, policy in terms of who we bring on board. We have both male and females. I've never been on a, a ship that uh, has only had one female participant, and so that's really positive. We've had forty six percent females. Uh, representation on our cruises for Schmidt Ocean Institute and we're constantly working to uh, expand our diversity and inclusion aboard. One, that's really great news for young people, young women who are interested in going into this field. A question from a panelist. Can any of the panelists discuss their organization's contributions to Seabed 2030? And Maybe one of you can just tell what Seabed 2030 is. And yeah, looking. Well, well, I can start because uh, our our organization Esri is uh, is on the advisory uh, board for Seabed 2030, and we also have uh, several of our uh, software uh, product engineers uh, working to actually help build the infrastructure for for the map. Seabed 2030 is basically a collaborative project between. Uh, JEBCO, which is the General Bathymetric Chart of the Oceans. Uh, that's a long-standing project that has been going on for decades. I think it was initiated by Prince Albert of Monaco uh, to, to map the global uh, ocean floor. Uh, we have for decades as a community been trying to achieve a map that is as detailed at least as uh, many of the maps that we have uh, of the land. So uh, we're talking about getting a, a map of the ocean floor that is at, le at least as detailed as the maps, the topographic maps that we have of our national parks, for instance. So Seabed 2030 now is a formal initiative that uh, is being funded by the Nippon Foundation uh, in Japan hmm. in association with JEBCO. And we, and it has uh, dozens of us, dozens of organizations, in, including uh, my colleagues, uh, their organizations involved as well. We're all trying to, to uh, get as much additional high resolution, detailed uh, bathymetry or, or maps of the seafloor, get this together by the year 2030. And, now, and, and to put it in perspective, we have to remember that the oceans what, cover 70% of the globe? Yes, the oceans cover only about, well, they cover 70% of our, our globe, but only, uh, I think now we're up to 19%. Thanks to Seabed 2030's efforts, the amount of the world ocean floor that has been mapped at this higher detail has moved from 9% to 15%, and now we're at 19%, but that's only 19% uh, of the Oh my floor. God, we still have more than 80% to go. Oh my God. But what's so special about Seabed 2030 is it's a global effort, and so you have people working together to really try to embrace this cause, and, and like we said earlier, it's so important to be able to characterize or understand our ocean floor. And those maps are critical, not just for understanding what our sea floors look like, but in order to be able to do further research, to understand what's there and where to target our efforts for our work. And Schmidt Ocean Institute is also really fortunate to be um, uh, have a par formal partnership with Seabed 2030, which um, we came into in 2019. And um, we are doing a lot of mapping to try and contribute to Seabed 2030. We hit a million square kilometers last year and um, have been doing a ton of mapping in Australia this year. So it's really fun work too, to be able to, you know, see in high resolution what's there on the seafloor. And Alison, I know uh, OET does a lot of work there as well. So this is not just say a, um, numerical data, this actual photographs, photographing the seafloor? Or is it more just like uh, using radar to uh, detect elevations and so forth? You know what I'm saying? Is it actual uh, physical? You can see it? It's, uh, it's sonar. So it's sonar. Uh, sonar, sound navigation and ranging. 
Sorry. Uh, <laughs> why, um, no, this is, is very important to, to spell this out, uh, even for those of us in the community to remind ourselves because uh, we all think about satellites. Whenever there's something that, is, that needs to be mapped right. globally, we think about satellites, but satellites cannot see through the water with the electromagnetic energy that they're using. So we, in order to map, make these detailed maps, we have to use uh, sonar, sound, uh, similar to what whales and dolphins use. And because of that, uh, uh, thank you, Carly. This is uh, fantastic. <gasps> and because, because of it, uh, it takes a little longer to to gather all of the the soundings. That's where the word soundings comes from. And then certainly for for uh, Schmidt and for uh, OET, they come in with this gorgeous uh, photography, underwater photography, uh, as well. So first sonar, then photography. And then what other big tool is, is useful? Are those the two main ones? Well, so I, I think so the first we have to create the maps, right? And then once we create the maps, then we can identify areas that we want to really go in and, and explore in further detail. So it's what we call a nested survey. So you start at of the, the resolution of the map and then you get smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of how, how close you get. So we'll go in with our uh, robotic uh, remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. Uh, we also, uh, one of the nice things about this whole effort is, you know, I think it's really helping to push a lot of the technology forward um, in an innovative capacity. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can more efficiently and effectively map the seafloor, not just with ships, but with other vehicles that we can deploy autonomously, uh, which is a really um, important aspect in terms of collecting data uh, you know, if we're going to actually do this by 2030, we're going to have to, you know, have a, have a lot of vehicles and a lot of ships out there mapping. Um, so I think it's pushed uh, the collaborations, but also uh, the innovations forward in a lot of positive ways. Okay. Well, there's so many questions. So here's a good one. Does sonar affect animal life, sea life, when they're doing the sonar to map the ocean? Good question. Yeah, that's a, that's a question that's, that's often asked. Uh, in my experience, and I will definitely defer to, to Carly and Allison because you, you've been uh, out at sea much more recently than I have, but in the, the surveys that I've been involved in, the frequency of the sound waves that we were using uh, was not harmful to, to marine life. But there have been other studies, especially with other types of, of we, we call them seismics, uh, where the frequency of the sound is different so that the sound uh, pulses can penetrate into the seafloor instead of bouncing off of the seafloor. Uh, that's for, for a different type of, of imaging. Hmm, interesting. Here's a question. I am so inspired by your personal stories. I myself am a marine technician in the U.S. Antarctic program, and I am in the midst of a scientific diving certification program. As a woman approaching 40 with no educational background in science, I would like to hear more about the path from marine... I'm now switching next page. Marine technician to where you are today. What advice do you have for people who want to contribute to find a way to ocean, contribute to ocean research? Wow, good for her. She's getting her marine technician. Well, I, it's a really good question, and I think an important uh, point is you know you don't you don't have to have a PhD to to work in this field, right? I mean, <clears throat> in, in order to make this work in terms of the community at large, it takes everybody. Um, that's one of the best things about oceanography in my mind is it's such an interdisciplinary uh, uh, field to be in. So you can study any flavor of science, technology, um, education. Uh, so, so it really takes a little bit of everything. And on a ship itself, like if you're interested in going to sea, um, you know, the thing that we have to say in, at the Ocean Exploration Project and with Dr. Ballard is, you know, we had a football team full of quarterbacks, you know, you're going to lose pretty quickly. And same with the ship. If you've got a ship full of PhDs, probably going to go aground pretty quickly. Um, so, like, you know, we, we really need uh, all skill sets at sea to really, to really make it work. Wow. So there's a lot of opportunity people without a scientific background. Uh, so talk about, I think there's a lot of young people watching this. Um, what ways are there, again, for all people of all uh, inclinations, if you're academic, if you're a more physical person, if you're even like an artist type, what opportunities are, they, are there for young people to get into this field? Because it's so critical, but it's so exciting. How can they get in? It's not just through one door, right? 
Well, I think there's so many opportunities now that there weren't before to be able to engage in the ocean science, whichever field you excel in. And um, a perfect example is Ocean has an artist in the program. So we bring artists out onto the ship to engage with the scientists to participate in doing the science at sea and then uh, interpreting the data that's collected and the, mes the methods that um, take place into the artwork. And that's just one way that we've been able to engage um, with different communities there. And with the technology, like Allison said earlier, you know, we're, uh, there are a lot of ships now that are live streaming their dives. And so there are so many ways you can be able to participate. Um, this year, we've been blown away by the support from different public communities that watch our live streams and participate and have scientists and, um, you know, citizen scientists interested in, in what we're doing and helping to identify species we're seeing on board uh, with the ROV. And so there are just so many different avenues available to people now. That is so exciting. God, that's great. Any other thoughts on ways that young women or anybody can yeah, I, contribute? Yeah, I can that a little bit. So similar to, to Carly's organization, we, we are also streaming everything that we, we do live. Um, we're at sea right now. So you can tune in to nautiluslive.org. Um, and follow along and uh, kind of be, have that over the shoulder view of our, our expedition and all of our researchers at sea. Um, Nautilus, we also treat it very much like a, a training ship. Um, so we run a series of internships that uh, young students can, can come out. Um, and that's one of the, the, my favorite parts of, of what we do out there is really training the next generation. Um, so we have internships in engineering, and that's ROV engineering or uh, video engineering and filmmaking. Uh, we have internships in seafloor mapping and ocean science. Uh, we also run uh, a program for educators so that they can in uh, impart that experience back on their, on their students, um, and that's our science communication fellowship. Um, so we have, we have a lot of opportunities uh, for, for students to get involved and kind of get that foot in the door, which is sometimes, you know, the most important step, in the, the first step in getting uh, into the career. Can't, I can't say, say enough about these uh, internships. What Allison just described is so awesome, so awesome. And, that, and then uh, with the internships that I'm hearing about, there are also these uh, competitions for, for young people to, to build ROVs. Uh, like the the mate ROV competition, I which is the been, remind people ROV is the robotic uh, remotely remotely operated remotely operated uh, and vehicle. Uh, I I'm really into Lego, so I've been involved in uh, Lego competitions. In fact, here is my Lego research vessel, <gasps> submersible. Oh my and gosh! There are all of these competitions <laughs> now for young kids to build their own remotely operated vehicles and ships in uh, in Lego, uh, the Lego First League. <laughs> so I love being a judge for those. <laughs> so <awesome. laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. Bill says, what are some of the biggest surprises or unexpected findings while mapping or something discoveries? Basically, any big surprises that in your work that Bill would like to know? Well, I'd love to start with this one because we had the biggest surprise of my life this year. Uh, earlier in April when we were doing an ROV dive, a robotic dive off the Ningaloo Canyons in Western Australia, we discovered what we believe to be the world's longest marine species, a 150 yes. foot saponophore. That made and headlines. It did, it did. And that, I mean, actually it's a perfect example of how science can really engage and captivate the public. It went global, um, but what a site, and you know, really shows we're in 2020 now and we're still discovering brand new things about the ocean. So that was, I'd say, the biggest surprise of this year for us in terms of our exploration. In fact, one of you techie people, I bet we could find a picture of it because I know it, was, it showed up in the news and it yeah. looks like a long, long. Uh, I'll pull one up right now. So you thank you. Right and you can share it. And it blew up Twitter in my neighborhood. <laughs> really? <laughs> and is it what kind of is it a what, what kind of sea life would it be categorized under? Is it like a jellyfish or is it not? A, it's like a long, long, long worm almost, isn't it? Oops, I think she got muted. Sorry, I was trying to screen share at the same time. Oh, no problem. 
Uh, yeah, it's a self-replicating organism. So it, it repeats itself over and over again. And so you can get these long chains, but we've never seen anything quite like this before. So Yeah, I, I know some people who can repeat themselves over and over. <laughs> There's some humans that do that. <laughs> All right. So you can be able to see it now. Um, unbelievable. Okay, that's the map. Isn't that something? Oh, are you, you seeing the map still? I'm seeing the map. Okay, let's try that. Now, can you see it? Not yet. I, I'm seeing it on, on my screen. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah, in fact, it looks like a contour map, but that is one single organism. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still just seeing The video is find it. more incredible, just, you know, seeing how long it goes. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Let's see, other questions here. Um, oh, of course, you know, we would not have a conversation about the ocean without somebody asking about, guess what, the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> have they ever figured that out? See, uh, same subject for all. Have they discovered any anomalies in the Bermuda Triangle? Have they even figured out what the heck is going on there? I thought they finally settled it. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm wrong. I sailed through it and I'm still here, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was involved in a, a Discovery Channel a series called Mysteries of the Deep. Uh -huh. And there is an episode that talks about the Bermuda Triangle. Uh, and it, it will be disappointing to those of you who, who think that there is a monster or something there. But I would recommend uh, Mysteries of the Deep on the Discovery Channel and checking out that, that episode. <laughs> Good. Um, Linda asks, reports of the bleaching of coral are alarming. Can you speak to that? Yeah, and we've all seen this. There, there have been superb documentaries about coral, coral reefs, and, and, and what's happening to them, which is just heartbreaking. Um, all right, can you speak? Can any of you address that problem? Oh, go ahead, Don. Go ahead, Allison. I was just going to say it's not really in my wheelhouse of, of expertise and, and we're largely focusing uh, more on the, the deep sea corals and, and really looking at what impacts of ocean acidification or climate change are, are having on the, the deeper corals. Um, but, but certainly we do see like the bleaching events happening uh, more frequently and I know that the Schmidt Ocean Institute is uh, off of the Great Barrier Reef uh, right now so it's but, but done. Go ahead. Yes, uh, to, to speak to that uh, as well. So uh, Allison uh, mentioned this ocean acidification problem, which is a global problem uh, as well. So uh, a lot of us think that we can go to a coral reef and inject it with something to make it better. Uh, and that's sort of part of it as well, because this is why we have these marine protected areas and why there is so much activity going on in places like the Great Barrier Reef to monitor the impact of humans in that area. But if we are putting too much greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, the oceans are uh, absorbing up to 90% of that. So on a global scale, all of us, all of our countries have to, to do better uh, and not put all of these harmful greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So it's the whole climate change, uh, changing your lifestyle uh, discussion. Uh, in our family, we're going to get our first electric car next year to do our part. You know, all of us can can do our part. And gradually, we, we hope uh, that we can get these coral reefs back to health. And this is one of the reasons why the United Nations is focusing on this as well, because all of us, uh, Carly, Allison, and I, are going to be involved in the United Nations decade for ocean science uh, in support of sustainable development. And that starts next year. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. That's wonderful. It, takes a it will take global policy changes. I know. And uh, another thing you can do is be vegetarian. Don't eat fish. No. Don't eat meat. That's kind of a simple individual thing you can do. Um, your thoughts, uh, Carly, on uh, Yeah, just to play off of what Alison and John said, um, coral reefs. we do a lot of deeper work, um, deep sea work as well. But you know, a lot of people discount the deep sea. Deep sea. They're always focused on some of those shallower corals um, and the shallower areas that are more visible or direct, um, you know, direct connection to those of us on land. But 
the deep sea is really an important place. Um, the ocean absorbs a lot of this carbon that we have <laughs> in our atmosphere from fossil fuels and climate change. And being able to not only um, understand what's happening on the deeper waters and that connection to shallower waters is important, but also being able to look in the past. So we've done a lot of work collecting coral fossils or drowned reefs. And why that's important is because it lets us see what the ocean was doing historically. And that's really important for modelers and not only to understand what happened historically, but to make predictions for the future and to understand where we're going with our oceans. And so these um, previous data sets really can impact and make us be able to kind of see what our future looks like. Yeah, and we should say, yes, the ocean has absorbed pretty much maxed out on what it can absorb of our CO2s. It has absorbed a lot, but it's it's reaching its its limit. Um, I also have to ask about, you know, yes, there is uh, ocean warming and acidification, but the other thing that people are very, very aware of is plastics in our ocean. And I heard recently that there's actually now more plastic, even on a microscopic level, more plastic on the bottom of our ocean than there is on the surface. Yeah, I read that headline a few days ago. So your thoughts on, is there any way to attack that problem? Seems like it's like we're getting all these problems from one side or another and it's gonna be overwhelming. But any thoughts on plastics in our ocean? Yeah, I think, I mean, in, in terms of the plastics, and unfortunately it's, it's a little bit of a pea soup out there and it's, you know, the problem is really like with right now with like microplastics, right? So you get this, you know, all these microplastics that have been broken up and are kind of pervasive throughout the oceans and then they're bioaccumulating within fish and then other things that are gonna go in and eat them. So the fish will eat it and they just keep eating more and more and then they're within within the systems of, of those organisms they get eaten and then it just kind of multiplies from there um, we're doing we're doing as much work as we can um, to, to help address and help the researchers that are studying that to really kind of come up with some uh, quantifiable uh, you know numbers with with what the what the issue really is um, so on the expedition that we're on Right now, we've got a, a young woman who's just starting her career and, and her thesis is, is wrapped around microplastics. Um, and so we're helping her take some of those samples. So really looking to, to the younger generation and that next generation to really um, help us come up with some of those solutions for, for addressing that because it is an important topic. Very important, really very challenging. Our final question, I would love for all of you to um, talk a little bit or give us your thoughts on um, the blue economy and what kind of potential and opportunities that has. This is a new phrase as I heard just in the last few months. Blue economy refers to everything dealing with the ocean, marine life, harbors, and all that. So it's a whole uh, big growth area, and I'd love for you to address some of the potential opportunities that young people or any person interested might, might have in the blue economy. We'll start with, I'll tell you, we'll start with Carly, Allison, and then Don. Well, I'd love to tie this question into the plastics as well and, you know, sort of end on a positive note in that, you know, there are more, there are more jobs and there are, uh, are more opportunities with technology development to tackle some of these problems now. And so there's a lot of opportunities to look not only at a blue economy, but a circular economy. How can we make sure that we are developing <clears throat> technologies and products that um, are keeping our oceans and our earth in mind and so that we're not recreating a problem with plastics and that we can start to tackle some of these issues and understand them better with the development of autonomous rob robots or multiple robots in the ocean. Um, and that also means a lot more job opportunities for engineering in the ocean, for technology development, and for general solutions to make sure that we're um, not only protecting, but making sure that our oceans thrive. Lovely. Allison? Yeah, I agree with everything that, that Carly just said. Um, and, you know, I think in, in my view, the, the blue economy is really rooted in creating a more sustainable future, right? And that's, you know, so it's being uh, thoughtful about the resources that we might be taking from the ocean, but do it in a way that improves people's livelihoods with the job creation that, that Carly's talking about. Um, but it also has an eye towards uh, addressing some of these big issues that we have with like climate change. Um, and what gives me a lot of hope right now is the recognition that some of the solutions in that 
um, are definitely intertwined with some of the other issues and challenges that we have that are tied, tied more to social and racial injustice. Um, so it's really mm -hmm. nice to see that recognition as, um, as part of the solution. Thank you. Yeah, Dawn, that, your that, thoughts. That, is, that is so great, uh, what, what Allison is saying about, about solutions. And in fact, one uh, saying that's going around now is that the ocean has been a victim of climate change, but it's, it is a powerful source of, of solutions. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the blue economy, I uh, really agree with both Carly and Allison about this because job, the, the, the new careers that are coming about now, and our company works especially with ports and with shipping companies and helping them to improve their supply chains. You know, we got toilet paper, thank goodness, during the early part of the pandemic because of the Port of Los Angeles, uh, because of the efficiency uh, of that port and how it operated and the new jobs that uh, are going to be coming online uh, in ports. Uh, also, in terms of ocean-based renewable energy, uh, wind energy, wave energy, tidal energy, a whole new uh, energy infrastructure to get us away from fossil fuels and fisheries and aquaculture as well. So I think the blue economy is super, super exciting. And to tie it back to uh, racial equity, uh, that I'm so glad Allison mentioned that, is that we need this blue economy to grow uh, in all communities, uh, all, all countries around the world. Well, that is a beautiful final statement. Thank you, Don. You wrapped it up just so eloquently. And I want to thank you all. And by the way, we have just everyone, all the comments are, we love this. These women are amazing. Um, you're carrying on the tradition of Marie Tharp. You might know who that is. Um, so everyone is just so impressed by what you do. And I know you're inspiring. Oh, there she is. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll have to Google her now. Let's Google her. Google Marie Tharp. I can't thank you enough. What you're doing is, is amazing. And you're paving the way for, um, for young women and young men and people of all shapes, colors, sizes, ages, uh, to find a place in the blue economy. And again, remind people that Althesee is putting on the Blue Hour, a fantastic drive-in event at the, it's not Long Beach Port, it's uh, the uh, San Pedro Port by the USS Iowa, an incredible uh, performance that deals with film and, and special appearances and art, and it's all about um, the future of the blue economy in Althesee. So if you want to learn more about it, it's happening tomorrow night uh, around 6 or 6.30. I think you have to have a, a, a parking space reserved. And you can get information on that, that at altasea-project-blue.org. Just go to altasea.org and I'm sure you can see that. So Allison, Carly, Don, you were fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And mostly thank you for the work and your expertise that is really uh, advancing science and helping to save our oceans. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.